Welcome to Unit 2 of NT501, Pentecostal Explorations of the New Testament. Today we'll be studying major scholarly trends that developed over the course of the last century. We'll begin with source criticism. The Gospels have probably been studied more than any other documents. One result of such intensive research is that the Gospels are seen as falling into two groups. Group 1 consisting of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Group 2 consisting of John. In the first, there's a very similar account. Because of this similarity, they have often been called synoptic. The word synoptic comes from a Greek word, synopsis, which means a common perspective or to view with. That is to say, these Gospels look alike. If the four Gospels are laid side by side, the text of the four Gospels, one of the things you note is that the first three columns, synoptics, are often full, and the fourth column is empty. And vice versa, when the fourth column is full, the synoptic columns are empty. Now there are certain major differences, or obvious differences, amongst the synoptics. One of this consists of length. Matthew's Gospel, of course, stands at 28 chapters. Luke 24, Mark 16. The material commonly called the Sermon on the Mount and some of the parables that appear in Matthew do not appear in Mark. And even material from the Sermon on the Mount that appears in Luke in a place called the Sermon on the Plain, there are differences. And even Matthew and Luke's material about the birth of Jesus differ from one another. But of course there are basic agreements the substance and content of the synoptics agree. There's a basic agreement on the order of the narratives, that is, the order of Jesus' ministry. And further, there are places that the Greek language is identical in wording. Now, all of this has led some scholars to believe that there must be some kind of literary dependency amongst the synoptics. That is, one of them must have used another or two Gospels. One of the ways that this uh, synoptic problem, that is, the explanation of the similarities and differences, has been answered is with Mark and Priority. In Mark and Priority, it's assumed that Mark was the first gospel to be written. One of the reasons is because Mark is the shortest of the gospels, and it is generally assumed that one is likely to expand a gospel rather than to uh, empty a major gospel and make it shorter. Another reason this is sometimes uh, put forward is because when Matthew and Luke disagree with one another, one of them generally agrees with Mark. In fact, they very seldom agree together against Mark. This is sometimes thought to suggest Mark has been written earlier. About 50% of the words of Mark turn up in Matthew, and about half of the content of Mark appears somewhere in Luke. The um, Gospels also tend to follow Mark's general outline. So it is often thought that Mark is the first of the Gospels written. Now if one accounts of all the Mark and material, accounts for all the Mark and material in Matthew and Luke, you find that there are still 200 verses that are similar in Matthew and Luke that do not appear in Mark. These verses are mainly discourse, that is, sayings, uh, verses. And they have, off, they have been given the title Q, which means uh, comes from a, a German word meaning source, quella. Now it's thought that early on the early Christians would have been interested, quite keen in fact, to come up with collections of Jesus' sayings. And we know that this is the case from a document called the Gospel of Thomas, which dates to the second century that was discovered in the last century. The Gospel of Thomas consists, I believe, of about 116 sayings of Jesus. There's very little narrative material. Normally it would say something like, and then he said, and we get a saying. There is some evidence that the sayings of Jesus may have even been collected by Matthew, an early Christian writer from about 115 named Papias, in fact, says that Matthew wrote the Tologia, the oracles of the Lord, in the Hebraic dialecto, perhaps in the Hebrew dialect. 
So there's no reason in principle why there couldn't be something like a Q. But scholars are divided over whether Q was a written source or it was an oral source uh, functioning in a society and in a culture that gave a great deal of attention to memorization. The next step in the, uh, this, this approach to the synoptics is what is called the four-document hypothesis. A scholar by the name of Streeter wrote a book called The Four Gospels, A Study of Origins. And he assumed Mark and Q in trying to account for all the materials that the Gospels contain. But what he found was that when you take out the Markan source and the Q source from Matthew and Luke, that it doesn't ac account for all of, all of those Gospels. 25% of those Gospels are not accounted for. So Streeter suggests that this material that one finds in Matthew but nowhere else be called special M material. That is, those verses that only appear in Matthew's Gospel. For example, Jesus will say on one occasion, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. For not one jot or tittle will fall away uh, until all is accomplished. That occurs only in Matthew. Likewise, the 25% of Luke that occurs nowhere else, he calls L material. In addition to things like the uh, birth materials, the birth narratives, uh, the, sermon, the um, parable of the Good Samaritan occurs uh, in this special L material. Now, Streeter thought that Matthew um, used Mark and Q and brought his own M material. He proposes, though, that there was a version of Luke called Proto-Luke, which consisted of Q and L material, and that at some point Luke comes across Mark and incorporates it into his gospel. One of the reasons he proposes this is because Mark uh, there are large stretches in Luke that have no mark and parallels at all. And so it appears to Streeter that this is how this was composed. Now for Streeter, he assumes the existence of Q, and he identifies Q as a Galilean collection of sayings of Jesus that were compiled in Antioch. He dates this collection to about the year 50. He says these were similar to the book of Jeremiah. It was a book of discourse. Mark is the second source, and he says is associated with Rome, about 66. The M material reflects strong Jewish tendencies of the Jerusalem Jewish Christians dating from about A.D. 60. This attitude is exhibited, as we said earlier, in a passage like Matthew 5, 17 through 20. L is material from Caesarea and is a bit most noticeable in the parables, as we've mentioned earlier. So one of the ways to treat the synoptic problem is to talk about mark and priority. Another view is the view that suggests that Matthew was the first gospel to be written. As early as Augustine, early church father, we find the view that Matthew was taken by Mark and summarized thus making Mark's Gospel a sort of Reader's Digest version. Following uh, Augustine was a German scholar by the name of F.C. Bauer of Tübingen. He revived Matthean priority, but he used what was known as the Hegelian dialectic, a philosophical approach to history that believes you begin history uh, results from a thesis, then that it generates an antithesis, and then things come together in a synthesis. Bauer looks at the synoptic problem through that lens. and He believes that Matthew was the thesis, the Jewish Christian gospel, that Luke was the antithesis, a Gentile gospel, and that the gospel of Mark is a synthesis that tries to bring those together, producing a what he calls an early Catholic view. Not Catholic in the Roman Catholic sense, but Catholic in the uh, great church sense, where the church comes together. This view has also been uh, put forward by a number of others. Uh, William Farmer has written a book called The Synoptic Problem, and he argues that Mark was the last of the Gospels, 
The reason he uh, argues in this way is he says because there is so much similarity between the Gospels that they must have known one another, and he believes that Matthew and Luke parallel one another so much that one of them must have used the other. He believes that Luke used Matthew because Luke's prologue says, acknowledges that many others have attempted to write accounts of Jesus' life, but that he was going to write an authoritative account for Theophilus. Another reason he believes it's Luke who used Matthew and not the other way around is because many of the people throughout the early church history placed Matthew as the first gospel. He also takes one of the reasons often put forward for Mark and priority and stands it on its head. He says the reason that Matthew and Luke rarely agree against Mark is because as Mark is writing his gospel, when Matthew and Luke agree, again, uh, disagree, that Mark follows one or the other. And that this makes more sense than to think that Matthew or Luke randomly agree against uh, or with, with Mark whenever they disagree. Street, uh, Farmer also suggests that Mark's gospel bears some of the characteristics of later gospels, apocryphal gospels. In fact, he would place Mark pretty late in the first century and point to the fact that Mark has a lot of what are called Latinisms, that is Latin loan words, or words that have been influenced uh, in Latin. Another way to, to try to solve the synoptic problem is to uh, put forward the view that all of the gospel writers drew on oral tradition. They weren't using one another's uh, uh, liter literary compositions, but they were relying heavily on oral tradition that eyewitnesses preserved. A scholar by the name of John Rist has written a book called On the Independence of Matthew and Mark. And he argues that this explains why we don't have more identical wording than what we do, that each of the gospel writers is preserving independent tradition. This was followed up by a proposal by a woman named Eta Linneman. Eta Linneman wrote a book called Is There a Synoptic Problem? She was a student of Rudolf Bultmann, but had a conversion experience after having uh, attained a, a post, a professorial post in Germany. And she came back to revisit the synoptic problem. She becomes convinced that oral tradition is the way to explain the problem. But there are problems that remain with any of these attempts. Now most scholars, I would say about 80% of scholarship, follows some form of mark and priority. I would say about 10 to 15% follow some form of Matthean priority, and, and about 5% probably appeal to oral tradition. Any of these theories can explain the data. Uh, the question is, in what order were these Gospels written? And we uh, may have some help in establishing those dates, and we'll see that as we move along. Now, the synoptic problem uh, and the, sort, the discussion of the synoptic problem is what we call source criticism. What sources did the gospel writers use in, in writing their gospels? Uh, and we see in the synoptic problem that these sources are major sources, like Mark, like Q, uh, like L and M. Building on the synoptic problem is a, an approach to the, to the gospels that is called form criticism. Now, form critics believe, accept, and build upon the conclusions of source criticism. Having identified the sources, the form critics attempt to get behind the sources to the individual units of material which compose the larger sources. Consequently, source criticism is the, is the starting point for form criticism. Form critics believe that the materials, that is, these individual units, can be classified according to their literary form. This form, they say, enables the students to reconstruct the history of the tradition. In other words, the forms themselves, they say, uh, 
tell us much about the historical reliability of an individual passage, or pericope. Thus, every literary form, form critics propose, has its own life setting, or zitzumleben. Now, form critics believe that since the Gospels are products of the Church, they reflect the needs and purposes of the Church. Consequently, influences upon the individual units can be detected. Form critics believe that there are three life settings for any uh, passage that one finds. There is the life setting of Jesus that a saying may go back to. There is the life setting of the early church that may, form critics suggest, have created a saying. And then there is the life se setting of the evangelist. Now, a quick example of how form critics would um, uh, work their way through similar statements. There is a passage in um, Matthew and in Mark which talks about, that has a saying of Jesus about the 99 sheep. In Matthew's Gospel, this occurs in chapter 18, and it has reference to um, not one member of the church being lost, that you should go out and leave the 99 and find the lost member of the community. In Luke, however, uh, this saying occurs in a place where Jesus is being criticized for eating with sinners. And there the saying means you have to leave the church as it is and go out and get the sinner. Now the form critic would say it's likely that this saying originally occurred in the passage in Luke in that context because it's, it's not likely that in the lifetime of Jesus that there's going to be a focus on the needs of the church and that Matthew represents such needs. Now in order to become further acquainted with form criticism, which has been a major, major um, method that has been used in gospel studies, we'll look at one of its architects. We're going to come back to the figure we met last time named Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann has looked at each passage in the synoptics and he has um, analyzed them and classified them according to their literary form. He's written a book called The History of the Synoptic Tradition and a shorter book entitled Form Criticism. We'll begin with his division of the materials in the, in the synoptics. He basically divides things into two categories, the sayings of Jesus and the narrative materials. In the sayings of Jesus, there are five major categories. The first category is what he entitles apophthems. An apophthem is a short saying of Jesus set in a brief context. There are three types of apophthems which are characterized by the different settings or causes for the saying. There are, first of all, he says, controversy dialogues. They are occasioned by the conflict, a conflict over such matters as Jesus' healing or his conduct or that of the disciples. For example, Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. These dialogues, Bultmann believes, basically represent the questions, the, the, the questions that the church had about the law and practices of piety. A second classification under apophthems is the scholastic dialogues. Now these are quite similar to controversy dialogues, but the controversy is not the starting point. Ordinarily, in these, a question is raised by someone requesting knowledge from Jesus. There are also a third classification called biographical apophthems, which Bultmann says purport to give us information about Jesus' life. These are quite sermonic. He would point to something like Matthew, uh, Luke 9, 57 through 62, where Jesus says, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now for Bultmann, the apophthems are what he calls ideal constructions of the church. While the decisive saying may go back to Jesus, nothing else does, Bultmann says. Names and places are not important, but simply incidental. The saying is the important aspect. Now the second category of sayings are called dominical sayings. 
Bultmann divides these sayings into three groups with independent treatments of the I am sayings and the parables. The first category under dominical sayings are the logia, that is, proverbs. These sayings show Jesus to be a teacher of wisdom comparable to other categories of wisdom. And there are three basic forms of proverbs. There is the declarative form, that is, the statement. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Or, many are called, but few are chosen. There is the imperative form. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. And there is the question form. How can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, Bullman's evaluation, historical evaluation of these sayings, is that the wisdom sayings are least likely to be the authentic words of Jesus. They are the least characteristic, he says, and significant for historical interpretation. The other category, a second category under the uh, uh, dominical sayings, are prophetic and apocalyptic sayings. Now these are sayings in which Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God, repentance, salvation, and woes. Mark 1.15 is a good example. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now for Bultmann, while some of these sayings are authentic due to their emphasis, which differs from Jewish eschatology, the church has no doubt uh, added to these uh, and so one cannot be certain if these go back to Jesus or not. A third category of dominical sayings are the law and Jewish piety. That is, sayings that take up the regulations of the early community. Two examples here. The question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Jesus, in another occasion, says there is nothing outside a man which by going into him can defile him, but the things which come out of a man are that which defile. Now for Bultmann, the church possessed a core of genuine sayings, like the two examples that I've just given. But the church added to these and placed Old Testament citations in them, so one cannot trust them all as going back to Jesus. The fourth category of I am sayings are those where Jesus speaks of his person and work in the first person. Bultmann rejects all of these as the church's introspective discussions. Most come from the Hellenistic community, and for Bultmann that's a sign of their lateness. The final dominical categories are the parables. The parables are concise stories told in simple language which are intended to call forth judgment on the part of the hearer. Now, Bultmann concludes that while Jesus no doubt told parables, the church has contextualized them so much that it's next impossible to be certain of their authenticity. The other major category of material are what call, are called the, the narrative materials. In Bultmann's first category of the narrative materials are miracle stories. Miracle stories are stories of healing or nature miracles in which the miracle itself constitutes the main situation. Bultmann studies the miracle stories and he reduces them to three movements. First he says one is given the condition of the sick person. Next he says the healing itself is recounted. And finally the consequences of the miracle stories are unfolded. Now, Bultmann suggests that these do not go back to Jesus because they are so similar to miracle accounts found in other places, like a Jewish tradition, uh, like the Hellenistic world. His other category, division of the narrative materials, are what he calls historical stories and legends. Now, he groups these together because he says it is difficult to tell the difference between the two. So you can tell that in this uh, emphasis on form criticism that the sayings are often the important thing and that there is a rather historically skeptical attitude toward the New Testament writings. Now, form criticism gives way and has been of great service to those involved in what has been called the quest for the historical Jesus. And the quest for the historical Jesus has eventually developed certain criteria of authenticity.
You can read about this in your textbook, but I'll lift up the primary criteria that one finds again and again. And that is called the criterion of dissimilarity. Now this criteria is designed to be absolutely sure that Jesus said something. It doesn't purport to try to figure out what he may have said, but rather what one can be absolutely certain he said. So this is how the criterion of dissimilarity works. If a saying is paralleled in the early church, that is, if a saying of Jesus is of interest in the early church, this criterion says you cannot be sure that Jesus said it. The early church might have created it. Or if a saying is of such a nature that anyone, any Jew of the period could have said, then you have to assume that it was a piece of popular teaching, not Jesus, who forms this. If the sayings are uh, of Jesus uh, fit neither of these categories, then one can assume that Jesus did indeed say this. Now part of the problem is that um, while these criteria will give you a certain result, the result isn't really worth having. I mean, if you compare it to studying early Pentecostalism, if you use the criteria on early Pentecostalism, what you would be able to be certain of is that there were some early Pentecostals who handled snakes because people spoke in tongues throughout the years, people believed in sanctification throughout the years, people believed in and practiced healing throughout the years. Consequently, um, there is nothing distinctive aside from something like snake handling. And of course the problem is that while that tells you about a very small group in the early tradition, it doesn't really give you a sense of what Pentecostalism was about. Well, a couple of words of evaluation of form criticism. Form criticism tends to lead to historical skepticism. It tends to attribute far too much to the early church and very little to Jesus himself. And this is just not very reasonable. Form critics act as though the eyewitnesses played no role in passing on the gospel tradition. And they sever the material from Jesus just way too much. For form critics, the use of literary forms in their analysis is fair enough, but to conclude that literary forms can then tell us something about whether some uh, an event or a saying actually took place is a great big leap. Uh, part of the problem here is to take, take the example of the parables. When Jesus told parables, we're not sure if what he told us uh, in the story itself is fictional or whether it took place. That is, is he basing the parables on some event he observed or is he making up a story to illustrate his point? That has nothing to do with whether or not the story itself has nothing to do with the historicity of the events described in the story. Uh, and so to, to attribute literary form uh, or historical reliability issues to literary form is, is a huge jump. Um, this um, this this is one of the places at which uh, form criticism and the criteria have have been uh, criticized and 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 rather uh, fairly. Uh, now, if form criticism does not explain how the gospels were transmitted, then what does? So we'll look at this point at the options to form criticism. There are two or three options to form criticism that we'll consider. First of all, two Scandinavian scholars have challenged form criticism. One scholar by the name of Harold Reitzenfeld and his student named Birger Gerhardsen. Now they have both done extensive studies of the Gospels and have discovered that in each level, in each part of the gospel tradition, Jesus is treated as a teacher, as a rabbi, they go on to say. And they suggest that Jesus' words 
would be at least as trustworthy and taken care of by his students as rabbinic students uh, treasured the, the words of their rabbis. The, the rabbis taught in the following fashion. They would begin a discussion amongst their students. They would lead the discussion. They would ask a question, lead the, the students in a discussion, and then summarize this discussion in a short, crisp kind of saying. They would then require the students to memorize this. The rabbis had a saying that the best student was like a lined or plastered cistern that doesn't lose a drop. Now, Gerhardt and Reisenfeld say that it makes sense that Jesus' disciples would have been just as effective in terms of preserving his words. And they further go on to say that there is New Testament evidence for that. They point to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says about the resurrection and the Lord's Supper respectively, that what he has delivered to them is that which he himself received. Gerhardson and Reisenfeld point out that these are technical words of transmission of tradition. And so they argue that the words of Jesus were memorized very early on and then passed on. Now there are no doubt some truth to what they're saying. Part of the problem, of course, is that their examples come from Paul, not the Gospels, and Paul, of course, was a rabbi. We're not exactly certain whether uh, this is how Jesus' disciples functioned. In fact, Jesus seems to have functioned more as a charismatic leader than a rabbinic figure. Another option to form criticism, and something that does go into um, thinking about how the gospel material was transmitted, come from two scholars independently, a German scholar by the name of Heinz Schurmann and an American scholar by the name of Robert Gundry. Now, both of these scholars have studied scribal habits, that is, note-taking techniques, in both Jewish and Hellenistic societies. And they both concluded that one or more of the disciples were likely to have taken written notations of Jesus' teaching during his earthly ministry. The person who is often cited as the most likely candidate is Matthew. Uh, Matthew Levi, if you can make that connection between the two of them, would have been a scribe, that is, trained in reading and writing, would have been someone who would have been um, familiar with the sacred tradition of Israel and would have known something about the sacred tradition of Jesus. So perhaps written notations were made. A third scholar that, that um, uh, lifts up an option to form criticism is a scholar by the name of Earl Ellis. Earl Ellis argues that there are signs that in the ministry of Jesus itself, there was a need for written formulations of his teachings. In particular, he asks the question, when the disciples are trained to go out and preach, what is it that they preach? Already there would be a need for them to have formulations of Jesus' teaching before they go out to preach. Consequently, he would argue that because you have this so early, these needs so early, that there have to be sections of the gospel materials that are already in existence. He would further point out that because so much of first century Judaism had been Hellenized, that is, because so many people know Greek, that the idea of a long period of transmission of Jesus' sayings in Aramaic uh, does not quite fit the evidence. Because uh, as soon as people are hearing these, these teachings in bilingual contexts, they are already making the transition from one language to another. Consequently, Ellis would argue that there are other options to form criticism. So in this lecture, uh, this part of the lecture, you can see that there's been a lot of study on how the gospel, the gospel traditions have been transmitted and form criticism has been dominant, but it is not by no means the only approach uh, 
and there are strong reasons to doubt that form criticism answers the questions uh, as it has been presented. In the next part of the lecture, we will turn our attention to redaction criticism.